to Rusty Alcoholic Garage. Today, two people eat lunch. No, in all seriousness, this is my buddy Ronnie. You heard him briefly in a previous episode. Um, on this portion, today is going to be a weird day. We're actually filming three episodes in one, in one day. But this episode is going to be about completing the CNC plasma cutting table. There's the computer for it. We're still kind of setting up the software. We need to break this in and everything. But, um, yeah, so I bought it. He's going to be the one designing and using it. Using it, and hopefully, we can get stuff cut. So, going to pause real quick and we're going to eat. Figure. Hey guys, so we got some lunch in us. Ronnie is trying to learn Autodesk. Autodesk? Autodesk? Yeah, Autodesk. Autodesk. He knows Design Spark? Yep. Design Spark Mechanical. Kind of the same thing, but this CNC plasma cutting table was designed to work with Autodesk for the way it has to cut everything. And we're pretty sure Design Spark could do it as well, to be completely honest. But all the instructions we have are for Autodesk, so. He's learning Autodesk. I'm gonna set up time lapse because we still need a hook. The plasma cutter to the control box and we have to set up the arm. So I'm gonna set up time lapse and we're gonna go ahead and get this all hooked up.
hooked up, well, I haven't necessarily hooked up the torch yet, but it's in the holder. We can put it in the jig easy enough. Um, we still have to run air around the shop. We haven't done that yet. And I don't think I'm going to film that because, I mean, that's unique to our setup. I mean, you'd normally just have an air tank, plug it right into the back, yeah. and you're done. Um, we ran the break-in program twice. Um, of course, this was time-lapse, but it is kind of loud, but it's actually not bad. Um, we just still having a conversation standing right next yeah, to it. Yeah, we could definitely talk standing right next to it. But uh, we, we tried cleaning it with WD-40. I tried uh, lubricating it with some white lithium grease. That's not in the instructions, but we both have 3D printers. Um, you use this type, I use a belt type. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we just know keeping everything lubricated really helps. Uh, the only thing about this that I did not like is the way you hook up the torch so that box can fire the torch. They gave you the craptastic um, splitter, crimper, cutter, whatever. Yeah. Where are they? It's this crap. Where basically you put it over the wire and it, it crushes it and tries to crimp it and it's just junk. I, you know, if, if I have one complaint about this whole setup, this is crap. So, um, I did it my way. Uh, I cut everything off. I cut the terminals off. And I, uh, I crimped everything together. Uh, it's, it's a safer way. It's going to last longer. And the other thing is I popped out a little window so the cord could come out. Um, in the instructions, they were like, just smash the cord in between the side. And I was like, no, no. Um, so trying to learn Mach 3, I've never used it. Uh, we're used to 3D printers, and on 3D printers, you usually have a set of limiting switches. It's just a little switch that toggles on and off, and that's how you home the machine. So usually on this setup here, because this was this is y. y, this is X. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So you would have a switch here. So as the Y came down, it would click the switch and it would stop. Same with X. It would get to here, click the switch and stop. And that's how you would auto home the machine. And that's how we do it with 3D printers. And we have different 3D printers. You have a Cartesian style? No, you have a Core XY style. Yeah. He has a hybrid style. He designed his own. I have a Delta. Now Deltas are unique because instead of having well, everything's X, Y, and Z, but instead of moving the build plate up and down, a Delta has three rods and it just moves the whole print head. So we're used to, on my Delta, it raises the whole unit up and you hit three switches and that's zeroed out home. And then in the configuration, I tell it, you can go down this much and it will not go past that. On this thing, no, nah, you, you could destroy it, shoving it, wherever you wanted to. Um, but I get why they did it. Like, in thinking about it, especially because it's like, oh, I want to cut a piece of metal over here. What you do is you manually move it out. And what I like right now is, and I have the keyboard for it, up is up, down is down, right is right. Like, I have it accidentally orientated perfectly for the keyboard. I love that. But so what you can do is if your piece of metal is over here, you can just do here and say it's up a little bit and then you hit X and Y over there and that tells it, hey, this is zero. This is where your home is now and that's where it starts, starts cutting your piece of metal. So I, I like that. In a way, it's simpler. Yeah. You know, uh, I will tell you compared to doing 3D printing, this is a lot easier, in my opinion. Yeah. You yeah. know, uh, 3D printing was a hell of a learning curve. <laughs> um, yeah, it is. But I like it. I mean, I have, now because we should be able to do this. And see, now it's back to zero. Like, this works, this works really well. 
I have no complaints. And like you just heard, it's not that loud. It's really not. Um, so we're not gonna print anything right now because we don't really have anything to print yet. Or print, I'm sorry, cut. I'm used to 3D printing. We're not printing anything, we're cutting things. God, I'm gonna have to get used to that. But anyway, um, overall, I love it. We haven't even cut anything yet. Ooh, this, that is gonna take me forever to get used to. But um, yeah, that's probably gonna be the computer I keep. That's actually just a cheapo test bench I built and all the green parts were printed. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And that's actually a neat little board and I'll go over that later. But um, no, I like the software. Um, yeah. it, it's more intuitive than I thought it would be, truthfully. Yeah. Um, right now, Ronnie is working on designing a... Uh, Time to pull. Yeah, there's the pulley. Here, I'll get out the sensor. So, one of the things we really wanted to use this for was to make a couple of plates and cross members. And one of the hardest things to do on a diesel is get accurate RPM. Now, a lot of people use the alternator and you can configure it and you have a sensor that goes around the alternator. I don't like it. I'm sorry. I'm sure it works. I'm sure for most people it's fairly accurate. But as I said, I think in the very start of this whole series, I wanted resolution of data. Like that was my big thing. And what this is, is off of a Ford, uh, and it was multiple types, and it's off a EDIS, uh, Electronic Distributor Ignition System. Mm -hmm. And what this is, is they put these right next to the crank, and this would tell the Ford ECU what position the crank was in. So, using the same principle, and these are simple two-wire things, all it tells you is, hey, there's a spot, and it's, ooh, it is magnetic. Yep. Didn't realize it. But when Kubota Swappers made this pulley, this is the pulley that comes that you can get from him. I specifically asked him, hey, put four notches in that. So that was a custom thing he cut. So what it will do now is for every full rotation, I get four pulses, like a four cylinder, because this is a four cylinder. And we're designing a plate so we can mount this close enough so we will have very accurate RPM. It's no guesstimation, no nothing. Whatever the engine RPM is, this will pick it up. Now, I actually need an RPM signal for at least two devices and possibly three. So what Ronnie is designing right now, and well, it's gonna be hard to see. I'll, what we'll do is put, here, scoot over a little bit. Yeah, that right there. And I'll superimpose it right here bigger with a screenshot. But he's making a plate that can go underneath this crank and we can mount two to three of these. And it will have about an eighth inch of um, slop. slop adjustment. And the reason why we're gonna use two or three of these is you really don't wanna split an RPM signal. Uh, just because it can degrade and everything. And there are uh, boxes you can buy that amplify them and whatnot. But these Ford sensors are so cheap. Because yeah. they made millions of them. I, I'd rather just have two or three of these, to be honest. Because I need this for the tachometer. I'm going to have a second one for the, the transmission control unit. And if I go to a electronic boost controller I'm gonna have one there so I know I at least need two we might have three and again this will give me precision RPM so anyway I hope you enjoyed that um, the next video of this will probably be when we finalize the design for that and we start cutting yep. might be today might not um, well it might be today I don't might see why not today is today. yeah, yeah. I mean, we still got that yeah, we still got a ton of time. So anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked it, give a thumbs up. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, consider subscribing. If you have, thank you so much. We'll see you again soon. Bye.